but oh boy Rolling Stone just went full retard. I'm just a regular gun-toting dude out in rural Alaska. I'm not as suave as Mr. Coley Noir, not as OAF as Chris Costa, but I am something that most Hopla folks think doesn't exist, an educated gun owner. So, if you've got a few minutes to listen, we're going to talk some real gun sense. I'm going to start this out by rocking my best Elliot Feynman impersonation. And you who've had any dealings with his NGVAC OMG WTF BBQ will know exactly who I'm talking about. Except my hat's better. And underneath that hat are more solid facts and personal experience with gun issues than mere regurgitated talking points based on half-baked assumptions. I also don't have the propensity for talking over guests who don't see things the way that I do, nor hit them with the band stick on my Facebook page when they start to engage in a level of naughtiness that doesn't approach the violent rhetoric of sympathetic gun control cultists. In all seriousness, I understand the plight of folk like Feynman and their natural reaction to gun issues, especially if they have suffered a personal tragedy, much like Feynman did. His son was um, killed in the streets of Chicago by an armed thug. And naturally, their tendency to want to respond to do something so it doesn't happen again, very understandable. But there's a proverb that says in order to fight effectively, you need to be counseled effectively. And unfortunately, folk like Feynman and Kirsten Gwynn, the Violence Policy Center, and the Brady Campaign all tend to want to be counseled by ignorance, or at the very best, a very shallow knowledge of guns, gun issues, and what goes into responsible gun ownership. Um, let's take, for example, Kirsten Gwynn's astoundingly vapid piece that appeared in Rolling Stone magazine the weekend of the World Cup Finals. Had the misfortune of appearing in Rolling Stone. Misfortunate mostly for Rolling Stone because it used to be a magazine with some with a pretty good reputation on it, but this has really detracted from it. I mean, it is really a horrible piece of writing. Uh, not so much in terms of grammar or style, but content it's largely content free i mean it has a very promising title here the most dangerous guns in america these are the farms causing the most harm and at a glance it seems like just got a little bit of research done into it for example looking at the fbi and finding that nearly 70 percent of homicides are have been committed with firearms but note here what's not being said says 70%, but 70% of what? Uh, a million? 10,000? Doesn't say. Nor does she give any sort of frame of reference that would make this number really significant. And this is something that a lot of um, gun-averse journalists tend to do. They don't tell the whole story. They'll tell something that sounds dire or ominous, but doesn't say anything that might give a better frame of reference. You'll see this throughout the entire article right here. But let's get going on and find out what gun number one is. Pistols. Pistols. Not a specific kind of pistol, just pistols in general. Which, you know, kind of left me cold right here because I was expecting something like, I don't know, a kel or, I don't know, Glock or Desert Eagle or High Point even. But no, it just says pistols in general. But what does she say about pistols? Pistols are popular among handgun owners. Well, derp. Of course handgun owners would be would would have pistols. What else does she say? Pistols are defined by their built-in barrel. Most firearms already have a built-in barrel. Pistols also have a short stock. No, they do not. This is a grip. It is not a stock. And this really kind of puts the sort of ignorance that 
these sort of people have on open display, they don't know what they're talking about. And so they try to fill in something that sounds technical, something that sounds official, and wind up just making horses' hinds ends of themselves. And even when they try to use stats and everything, it's, it's pretty transparent if you know what you're looking for. I mean, she tries to impress people with this big 119,000 number right here that supposedly represent the number of pistols that were recovered at crime scenes by the, according to ATF stats. But that does not necessarily mean that 119,000 pistols were used in crimes. It may very well just have been incidental right here, something completely unrelated and definitely not used. Now, Another thing that she just gratuitously does right here is mention Glock because it is the most popular handgun out there. And I guess she is trying to make a, the leap that because Glocks are highly popular, that they must be highly popular in crime. But none of this says this. And she has nothing that would substantiate that if, in fact, that was the point she was making. No, just throwing it out there as if to demonize Glocks, you know, guilt by association. So, number three, or number two actually, revolvers. Um, revolvers are a kind of pistol, if I'm not mistaken. But for some strange reason, she just felt the need to just kind of give it its own classification. And uh, what does she have to say about that? That revolvers are named for a revolving chamber. Well, derp. I mean, tell us something we don't already know. Well, she does tell us that 46,000 were recovered by, according to ATF stats, from crime scenes in 2012, but doesn't say that these were necessarily used in those crimes. Same thing as the last time. And then, for the gratuitous ver verbiage right here, saying that also grenade launchers have rotating barrels. Shotguns even do. Maybe even some rifles. Um, no. The only, they may have a rotating drum, like certain grenade launchers and certain shotguns and maybe even certain rifles right here, but to put this in the same league as them, again, is trying to do this whole guilt by association thing, as if these are as destructive as anything that she had mentioned. Ignorance on full display. And she's got a captive audience to disseminate this ignorance, and they'll probably eat it up as gospel. Except, fortunately, this uh, article is widely panned by just about everyone. Then comes up to rifles right here. And right outside of the gate, before you even read any of this, they've got the picture of the demonic AR-15. It's almost like standard fare among a lot of journalists. Oh my god, it's an evil black rifle. We must talk about it and we must say bad things about it. But what does she say? Just that 39,000 of them were pulled from crime scenes. Again, nothing that says that they were actually used in the crimes. They just happened to be there. But she also says something right here that does hint that that 39,000 is different from murder, say, only 320. Hmm. Again, hinting at the fact that this number is, by and large, meaningless unless they were actually used in the crimes themselves. But look at this number right here, 320. That is, I mean, a lot of times anti-gun journalists and those who write these sort of articles tend to try to throw out any number out there and hype it up, blow it up, try to make it sound really scary. 320, I mean, chances are you personally will not see 320 murders in your, life's, in your lifetime. But nationwide, this is a tiny number. A very, very tiny number. Yeah, I can't tell you the, the millions of rifles that are in this country right here, but if that's the case, this is almost insignificant. And to put this AR-15 right here, those were not responsible for the majority of these 320 murders right here. And she doesn't even go so far as to say that they were. Just put the picture out there, guilt by association, AR-15, murder, you know, it's it's dumb. But talking about AR-15s right here, there are about five or six million of them in the country. And I would have to say only a handful out of that 320 were actually used in some sort of murder-related crime. Going next to 
shotguns yay what does she have to say what jewels of wisdom does she have to impart to the public right here something that we did not know before that shotguns are fired from the shoulder derp may release a single projectile double derp Unlike rifles, however, one pull of a shotgun's trigger may also spray the target with round pellets or a shot. Uh, then she talks about how they're they're powered by explosives. I'm sorry, no, 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 no. The it's done by powder that is chemically formulated to burn at a certain rate. It doesn't explode. Which, again, it's a technicality that the gun ignorant would not know. And again, the numbers keep going down. 27,000 shotguns seized, but, but only 303 used in some sort of murderous crime. Huh. There's a difference between the numbers. Those 27,000 were not necessarily used in those crimes. But it's something that she doesn't bring up. Just put that number out there and make it the problem sound like it's a bigger than it actually is. And finally, this this is derpage at its finest, a derringer. I, I can't tell you how many stories that I have read that involve the derringer because I've never read it before. Single shot something? No, usually they bring up something like a semi or you know a rifle or shotgun, but this right here and even the numbers that she lists show that it's really small, 2,000 below, and they were recovered, not necessarily used in crime. And come to think of it, she doesn't have any stats right here saying that there's this bit of hysteria from the VPC regarding 50 BMG rifles in 2003. Now, despite the title, shooting down a civilian aircraft on U.S. soil with one of these has never been done. And in the 11 years since the study was published, still no civilian aircraft have been shot down with one. Now, to further agitate hysteria over 50s, the VPC tries to keep a tally of alleged crimes involving 50 BMG rifles. However, in these reports, sometimes the VPC seems to have a hard time distinguishing between rifles chambered for 50 BMG and 50 Beowulf. Now, the overwhelming majority of these reported crimes did not involve the use of a 50 BMG at all. Since 1989, only four crimes have actually involved one. And, of course, when it comes to proposing more liberalized concealed carry laws, there is always at least one high-profile doofus who will invoke the OK Corral, which, historically speaking, has never happened in any state or other locality where it has passed. But gun control advocates don't look at history nor facts contrary to their narrative. They seem to prefer emotion and ignorance to bolster their arguments. So, what can we do to combat this sort of ignorance? I mean, obviously, engaging them on their own turf out in cyberspace is one option, but I have found that to be, by and large, a pretty ineffective tool. I mean, in the exchange of ideas, the Internet's a great medium, but as far as actually convincing someone and changing their minds, that takes more of a personal touch. And while I'm not a big one of certain new age phrases and, and everything, the whole mantra of think globally, act locally makes a lot of sense. And in my own personal experience, the the minds that I have changed the most have been those who have known me personally and have gotten to know me personally. So that is one thing to do. Affect the people locally where you are. Take someone who has never never been to a range range and fire one of these and help them to see exactly that it's not a monstrous piece of hardware that it is something you can control it's not something it's something to be respected but not something necessarily to be get hysterical about or or take them to shoot one of these and help them to see that it's not quite the quite the evil instrument it's not the weapon of mass destruction that it's oftentimes demonized as being now that brings up something I always, I've always wanted to do. I've always wanted to take one of these and put them in the hands of a hoplophobic friend and ask them three questions. So if I can play this out in front of my audience right here, this is what I would do. Say for instance, I am, I am at a friend or relative's house and I'm showing off my hardware to someone who's interested and all of a sudden a hoplophobic friend comes in and kind of 
shows this look that tends to be a mixture of fear and disgust, maybe even in, in a disparaging remark about firearms. And for me, teachable moment right there. I'd come up to him and say, hey, um, are you the sort of person who's really open-minded and believes that dialogue is necessary towards getting the understanding of something? No doubt they'll say yes. And so I would say, well, allow me to indulge in a little social experiment with you. What I'm going to do is I'm going to let you hold this, and I'm going to ask you three questions if you're okay with that. Um, I want you, and I would demonstrate that the weapon is safe, as I usually do have my mine safe. That the safety selector switch is set set on safe, and the chamber is also flagged. You know, indicating that you know there is no way a bullet is going to get to the chamber and be fired. Put it, put it, switch out the magazine. At the magazine, turn it over and say, "This weapon is safe." But all the same, I want you to observe basic gun safety handling policies. Watch where the barrel is pointed. Point in a safe direction. Keep your finger out of the finger guard, out of the trigger guard, I should say. Yep, put it in their hands and start off. Say, how do you feel right now? Feel kind of anxious, maybe a little bit, a little fearful, maybe a little disgusted or awkward, which is okay. Question number two, do you feel, among those feelings you, you are experiencing right now, is a murderous rage one of them right now? Do you all of a sudden feel the the urge to shoot up a school or a movie theater or something like that. Chances are they probably don't. Then the number three question would be, well, that weapon that you're holding right now is not that much different from what was used at Sandy Hook or the Aurora Movie Theater or the Clackamas Mall. Um, but there is one major difference right here. Can you tell me, could you possibly guess what it is? And it's not the optics, it's not the handguard, it's not the chamber flag. Um, it's really the person holding it. It's you. And also I want to uh, demonstrate, and I would take it back and say, I would also want to demonstrate that this weapon has been out in the open for a few minutes and not a single person has been shot or threatened. Or and certainly no mass shootings have been happening. So just the mere presence of these things doesn't necessarily guarantee that something like that will happen. Thank them for their time. Continue on their way. Thanks for taking your time to listen to this first episode of Talking Real Gun Sense. If you thought it sucked, it probably did. Hey, give me a break. It's my first real attempt at a informative video production. Bear with me, it'll get better, and I'll be addressing common hoplophobe objections to our Second Amendment rights, covering relatively current events, a few gear, re gear reviews, and maybe even an interview or two. Just remember, an unloaded mind is about as useless as an unloaded gun, so keep yourself current on what's what as we fight to preserve our rights to keep and bear arms. God bless. See you next time.